Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 5, The Hot Tub. Hello, everyone. Two hot and heavies in one week? How lucky are you? I'm spoiling you guys. Or I just needed to catch up, which is the case uh, due to being sick. These are some fun episodes, so I'm happy to be back behind the microphone and not be sick in bed. A few exciting things happened this past week, one of which being my daughter turned 13. I'm officially the parent of a 13-year-old, and it was great. We're, we're postponing her celebration to this weekend because her best friend, whose birthday is actually the day after my daughter's, which is so cute, um, they wanted to spend it together, and her best friend was out of town last week. So we will be celebrating this weekend. Her friend will come over. They're going to have a slumber party in the basement, watch some movies, get some food. Just so fun. Do you remember those days? The sleepover days, the best friend just giggling. And oh, I just, I have the fondest memories of uh, sleepovers with my best friend growing up. I mean, it's some of like my most joyful memories in my entire life, not just of my childhood, but just my whole life. <laughs> so it's so exciting to see my daughter starting that whole thing. And yeah, she's a teenager and I cannot believe it. She definitely is. She's always been mature for her age, but, you know, I just feel like it kind of goes in fast forward once they get into middle school. And, you know, I'm just trying to keep up <laughs> and not break down with some normal emotions because your kids are just growing up so fast, that old cliche. But I still have my my little guy, my 10-year-old son, who... um he still enjoys being cuddled and, you know, just kind of like my little baby. So <laughs> I'm just hanging on to that. That's been helping me through the maturing of my daughter to the point where I'm like, I don't, I think she's at the point where she'd rather not hang out with her parents. But you know what? It's normal. We all have gone through it. And I just, I had such a fun time kind of reminiscing over her 13 years when um, her birthday came along this week. Another exciting few events. I mean, oh my gosh, I, my comedy heart is so full. I mean, I think overflowing. In the span of one week, I got to see Tig Notaro, Tina Fey, and Amy Poehler, and actually Rachel Dratch as well. All of these ladies I got to see live in the span of one week. And it was incredible. For those of you not familiar with Tig Notaro, she is a stand-up comedian. She also has uh, multiple, well, she has one podcast now, but she's had multiple podcasts over the last, geez, since podcasts were invented, really. She is an incredibly funny comedian. I just love her. And she's just an awesome person. Uh, she right now has a podcast with Fortune Feimster and Mae Martin. It's called Handsome, and I highly recommend it. And she just recorded her last episode of her very successful podcast called Don't Ask Tig. And her very last episode, who was her guest? Oh, that's right. Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And it was an amazing episode. So, so funny. I was like, what is this gift? I mean, this is this is like the uh, gift from the podcast gods, my birthday gift. I highly recommend listening well to all of her podcasts, all of Tig's podcasts. But the uh, finale episode of Don't Ask Tig, her guest was Julia Louis-Dreyfus. And as she says in the intro to the episode, it's one of her favorite podcasts she's ever done. No surprise. I was very excited about that as well. And then the Tina Fey and Amy Poehler Restless Leg Tour. <laughs> they were in Denver over the weekend. I mean, I, I'm just still riding high. It's it, it was such an amazing show. I didn't really know what to expect. I was kind of like, well, they're not stand-ups and they're not really like singer performers. I mean, they know they can sing, but like, and I know that they're improvisers. I know that's pretty much, you know, how they started out in comedy. But anyway, I went in loving that I didn't know what to expect and then seeing it and just being blown away by these women. I mean, they're queens. I mean, they're comedy queens and they're such a such an inspiration to 
young women out there who want to pursue comedy and they really embody just believing in yourself. And even what am I saying? Young women out there, old women like me out here. (laughs) They inspire me every day. And it was just such an incredible night to see them live. And yeah, Rachel Dratch came out as Debbie Downer during one of their segments um, during the show. And it was like, oh my God, my like, I was just like, what is happening? (laughs) This is amazing. This sort of heyday of SNL for me kind of during my late teen, early 20s, years, you know, when those ladies were dominating Saturday Night Live. It was so cool to see. And just to be in the same room as them. Oh, I was totally nerding out and fangirling and all the things, as you can imagine. All right, let's get into this episode. The synopsis for The Wink is as follows. Kramer's body temperature falls after he accidentally goes to sleep in his broken hot tub. Jerry obsesses over whether a marathon runner who accidentally overslept and missed the Olympics may do it again while staying with Elaine. George avoids work by acting annoyed and looking busy, while Elaine struggles with writer's block. This episode was written by Greg Cavett and Andy Robin. We start out in Monks. Jerry is reading the J. Peterman catalog, Packed My Rod and Reel, (laughs) Lost in the Fjords. Oh, good thing she spotted my epaulets on my ice fishing vest or whatever. George is like, this whole catalog is about scoring in a foreign country. (laughs) Yeah, what do you do all day? Elaine says to him. Not that much, he says. Jerry says, well, I thought that promotion you got, let's, let's remember that George got the promotion to Mr. Morgan's job because, uh, well, basically Elaine's boyfriend didn't wake him up when he was supposed to. He's a wake-up guy because Jerry put mutton in his pockets. I mean, long story. Listen to the last episode if you need a refresher. Anyway, Jerry's wondering, oh, how come he doesn't have a lot more work with that promotion? And George clarifies, well, once the season starts, it's going to be busy. But until then, I just pretend to look busy. He explains that if he looks annoyed, then he looks busy. And then he does he does an impression of it, just kind of uh, looking around and just looking. And Jerry and Elaine are so impressed, very convincing. Yeah, he looks very busy. He says it's working so well that Mr. Wilhelm actually gave him one of those stress dolls. (laughs) Anyway, he's got to go back to work. (sighs) He looks annoyed as he exits. So apparently Elaine is working on a little catalog blurb for the Himalayan walking shoe. Jerry asks how it's going. She's like, oh, not good. She's going to work on it tonight. Oh, no, but she remembers that Marathon Runner is coming into town to stay with her. Who? Jerry asks. Elaine explains, you know, Jean-Paul, Jean-Paul, I met him when I was working for Pendant. I was editing a book on running. Oh, Jerry remembers him. Isn't that the guy who overslept at the Olympics? He missed the marathon. Elaine's like, yep, that's him. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, he's Trinidadian and Toboggan. And they discuss, how do you oversleep at the Olympics? Oh, it's the biggest event of your life. Elaine says, you know, he was really devastated. This is his first race in three years. Well, you got a big responsibility, Jerry says. Elaine's confused. I don't have any responsibility. What? You got to wake him up. Oh, Elaine says he'll wake up. And Elaine greets a friend who just walks in, Judy. She's pushing a stroller. Jerry recognizes her from Elaine's building. Oh, I didn't know she was married. Elaine leans in. She's not. And the guy just took off. Oh. She tells Jerry, don't say anything to anybody. He's like, who am I going to tell? I know, but it's just something you got to say. The actress who plays Judy is Susan Isaacs. She is a Groundlings alum. She has appeared in Scrooge, War of the Roses, and many other shows. She's also a very successful screenwriter. But what I learned about her that I think is the most fascinating and delighted me the most is that she plays the character of John Candy's wife in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Now, if you're familiar with the movie, we know that we never see the wife. She's only in the photo that John Candy's character carries with him because she's passed away. But this actress, Susan Isaacs, is the woman in the picture. I thought that was kind of cool. And I like her. You know, there's not much to the Judy character, but I think she does a good job. Good job, Susan Isaacs. And at least you weren't just in a picture this time. And then my take on the scene, this is really the first time we're diving into Elaine's job at the catalog. So I really love that. Of course, Jerry and George would totally dump on it. (laughs) That's just what they do in this friend group. And it's friendly ribbing, which is great because I love how Elaine's like, yeah, what do you do all day to George? (laughs) And he's very open. Not much. This is a glimpse of seeing Elaine and George being pretty friendly to each other. They're getting along. (laughs) And I love that she's so amused by George's 
annoyed slash busy impression, you know, yeah, he looks very busy. And then she even like really they take the time to show her very amused reaction, like fully laughing when he walks out like, wow. Elaine and George are totally amused by each other. And I like I like seeing that as well. I love when they get in fights and they bicker, but this is actually very nice too. And this entire scene does a great job introducing the plots of the episode. We find out a bit of George's story with acting annoyed. Elaine has writer's block with the Himalayan walking shoe and that the marathon runner is staying with her. Oh, and I love, I love this plot with Jean-Paul Jean-Paul this platonic friend that she met editing a book. Like, it's super feasible. And I just love that Elaine has this friend. <laughs> it's great. The exchange about telling a secret to someone, you know, like, oh, don't tell anybody. Even though they have zero connection to the person who has the secret, it's so relatable. Like, I do that too. Where I'm like, I'll tell something to a friend about a friend who's like in a completely different hemisphere from where they are. And I'm like, oh, don't say anything. And they're like, well, what? <laughs> but I say the same thing. I know, but it's just something you got to say. This really is one of the most flawless setup scenes of the series. There's a lot of information presented very organically. And JLD is so adorable in this scene. All right, next we're in George's office. He's reading the paper and there's a fly buzzing around him. He's trying to swat it when Wilhelm walks in with some budget info and hands him a folder. And of course, George goes into his routine of being annoyed. All right, George, I'll let you get back to work. And he's like, yeah, okay. And then George sees the fly land on the wall and he uses the file from Wilhelm to just start banging it on the wall, hitting it furiously. And Wilhelm sees this through the window and he's very concerned. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry and George are trying to figure out how Jean-Paul Jean-Paul overslept at the Olympics. George thinks he got the AMPM mixed up. Jerry thinks he hit the snooze, never came back on. Kramer enters with a bucket and he starts filling it with water at Jerry's sink. And he tells them he never uses an alarm clock. He has a mental alarm. He has to just set his head and he gets up automatically. It never fails. They ask what's with the bucket. Oh, his friend Lomez sold him his hot tub. It's in his living room. You have a hot tub in your living room? Oh, he loves it. It soothes every aching muscle. That water will get up to 120 degrees. Is that tolerable? Oh, it's tolerable. Isn't that the same temperature of the coffee that scalded you? <laughs> well, I think it's cooler than that. And Kramer exits. George has to ask. He doesn't have any running water. <laughs> I don't ask those questions anymore, Jerry says. Next, we're in Monks. Elaine enters with Jean-Paul and introduces him to Jerry. Jerry says, oh, nice to meet you. Sorry about the Olympics. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Elaine says she's going to go call work to get an extension. She can't come up with anything about that shoe. Catalog writer's block. Yeah, that's funny, she says, and walks away. So Jerry looks at John Paul. What happened? He tries to guess. Snooze? No, it wasn't a snooze. AM, PM? No, it wasn't the AM, PM. It was the volume. So apparently there was a separate knob for the radio alarm. Why separate knob? Why separate knob? Well, sometimes people like the radio alarm louder than the radio. Oh, please, man, please. Well, Jerry's like, that's not going to happen again. Elaine comes back. Elaine, what's your alarm clock situation? Jerry asks. Ugh, she's so annoyed. I've got an alarm clock. He asks if it's the same one that almost caused him to miss a flight to Cleveland. Flight to Cleveland. Elaine says, it works. Elaine, it works. My take on this scene, this is a great scene. I love this scene. And mostly because of the exchange between Jerry and Jean-Paul. I love how Jerry just dives in. And the actor who plays Jean-Paul is Jeremiah Burkett. And he's one of my favorite guest stars of the series. I mean, he plays Jean-Paul to perfection. Elaine's portion is is really good as well. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I like the way she says that. And really, Jerry, <laughs> are you are you writing the next great American novel when you write your stand up? Step down, okay? Her exasperation when Jerry asks about the alarm clock, like she knows where it's going. Such a great performance. I love that initial reaction. I mean, as soon as he asks, what's your alarm clock situation? She's like, Jerry. <laughs> uh, and then the flight to Cleveland. I, that gets me every time. <laughs> like Jean Paul's like, OK, maybe I do have something to worry about. All right. Next, we're in George's office. George is doing the crossword and uh, gets super excited when he thinks Captain and... Daniel! But his pen is out of ink. 
says, come on. And he starts slamming the pen down on the paper. (laughs) Again, great timing. Wilhelm walking in. And he's like, you know, George, I think you're taking work too seriously. Well, I got a lot to do. So Wilhelm gives him a fun assignment to take the Houston Astros reps out and show them a good time. George accepts, but, you know, he's still pretty annoyed about it. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Elaine enters. She apologizes. You're 40 minutes late, he says. What happened? I got held up, she says. She asks if she can heat up a muffin in his microwave. Elaine notices Jerry's attitude. What's the problem? Well, you said you were going to be here at a certain time, and you weren't. Yeah, and this all means what? Well, a man has come from very far away to compete in a very important race. He's put his faith in you, and frankly... I'm a little concerned. Oh, are you? Yes, I am. (laughs) And she's like, hey, look, I'm not running in the marathon. He is. And besides, she's got enough to worry about thinking about some load of crap for the Himalayan walking shoe. You know, she's given him a place to stay, but she's not going to turn her life upside down for this guy. Jerry's like, I'm not talking about upside down. I'm talking about waking him up. Right then, Jean-Paul and Kramer walk in. They just took a soak. And apparently it was the soak of the year. Kramer notices what's burning. Ugh, it's Elaine's muffin. What happened? I don't know. She says I set it for 20 seconds. But Kramer points out, no, you set it for two minutes. Don't say anything, she says to Jerry. And Jean-Paul says, you misset the timer. Ugh, it's not my microwave, okay, Jean-Paul? You know what, Jean-Paul, let's just go. Let's go. Come on. So as they're leaving, she says to Jerry, I'll see you at the race tomorrow. Oh, I hope so. Oh, that's cute. And they exit. Jerry is so stressed. You know, he's got to take over this whole operation. Kramer's just like, you're so tense, Jerry. You need to take a soak. (laughs) Yeah, right. Jerry's not going anywhere near that human bacteria frap. It doesn't even matter that Kramer opened the windows. You know, the air is cold. The tub is hot. It's like Sweden, man. Sweden. Then we see a quick scene of Kramer getting into his hot tub and he's so relaxed. And he's got weird nude undies on. (laughs) All right, my take on this scene, this tension between Elaine and Jerry is really fun. And it's kind of rare to see these two be at odds with each other. You know, um, usually they are together kind of ganging up on George or Kramer. They're definitely the more logical two of the group. But I love how this whole alarm clock thing just boils over in this scene between the two of them. And such a brilliant device to have the microwave screw up just (laughs) fuel Jerry's concern. And in turn, Jean-Paul's concern. (laughs) I love that. You misset the timer. (laughs) Poor Elaine. And then soak it a year is one of my most quoted lines in my house. I mean, any time the word soak comes up in whatever context, me and my husband must pause and say, so good a year. All right, next we are at a bar. George is out with the Astros reps who are very lively. They're dropping a lot of sons of bitches and bastards, having a good old time. And then we have a quick scene of Kramer freezing in his hot tub because the temperature dipped down very low. All right, next we're in Monks. Jerry's there with Jean-Paul telling him he's very concerned. He wants him to get the hell out of there. Let me put you in a hotel, he says. You have an alarm clock and then you'll have a wake-up call, Jean-Paul. It never fails. And Jean-Paul thinks it would be rude to leave Elaine's place. George enters and says, hey, you bastards. And tells him about his evening and how those men talk. And he tells Jean-Paul that's how they talk in the major league. And Jean-Paul really takes that in, you can tell. Kramer enters wearing four sweaters, tells the guys how his heat pump broke and he fell asleep in the hot tub. He can't get his core temperature back up. He tells Jean-Paul to feel his hand. And Jean-Paul feels it and says, this son of a bitch is ice cold. Uh, Next, we're in George's office. George gets a call from the Astros rep from the plane and they're drinking and cursing, of course. George is trying to banter with them, but with the connection to the plain phone, he needs to speak up. So he starts shouting, you tell those sons of bitches, no Yankee will ever come to Houston. Not as long as you bastards are running things. (laughs) And Wilhelm happens to walk by and hear this. He's horrified. He grabs a phone from George and hangs up. What's the matter with you? Next, we're in Elaine's office. She's at her computer trying to write. It's a cold winter's night in Timbuktu. Ah, this stinks. She picks up the shoe and grits her teeth in frustration. Come on. But nothing's coming to her. 
Uh, my take on this scene, it's a fun little scene, just driving home what she's dealing with other than Jean-Paul and Jerry's nagging about her alarm clock situation. You know, she still has this writer's block going on. Great physical comedy with JLD here, too. Uh, next, we're in Elaine's hallway. Jean-Paul is about to enter Elaine's apartment when Judy comes out of her apartment across the hall. He greets her and says he's a friend of Elaine's. And then he looks down at the baby in the stroller. Oh, look at the cute little bastard. <laughs> you are mommy's little bastard, aren't you? And Judy walks away so upset. And the super who overheard this and approaches Jean-Paul about him harassing his tenants. Oh, I'm just being friendly, you son of a bitch. And the guy throws him out. <laughs> and on the way out, Jean-Paul exclaims, Man, I got a race tomorrow. Next, we're in Jerry's apartment. George and Jerry enter into a super hot apartment. It's like a furnace. Well, Kramer's in there. He's trying to warm up. He turned up the heat. Well, turn up the heat in your apartment, Jerry says. Well, he's waiting on his new heat pump. Well, George tells him there's a huge box out in the hallway. Oh, that must be it. Yeah, you got the biggest one they had, 16,000 BTUs, and Kramer exits. The phone rings, and Jerry says, yeah, yeah, I can be there in 10 minutes. You can count on me. And he hangs up. George asks, what? I got the call. John Paul? John Paul. All right, next we are at a hotel, and uh, Jerry and John Paul enter. They're very lucky to get this hotel room. Jerry sets the alarm. He does a volume check, asks about music. Whatever, <laughs> John Paul says. He just needs to sleep. Jerry decides on adult contempo. And now the fail-safe, Jerry says. The wake-up guy. Yes, yes, the wake-up guy. So Jerry asks for the wake-up call, and uh, he repeats it. And the guy gets annoyed. You know, you're no more important than any of our guests. Yeah, I know that, but are you through? Yes, but boo. Got hung up on by the wake-up guy. <laughs> so Jerry's not sure about this. What is it? I think I offended the wake-up guy. What if he doesn't call now out of spite? John Paul's like, it is his job. No, well, he's not comfortable. And so they start packing up to leave. Next, we're in Elaine's apartment. Elaine enters and keeps calling out for Jean-Paul, but he's not answering. Looks around her whole apartment and says, oh, man. She calls Jerry, leaves him a message. Jean-Paul is missing. He's alone in the city. Call me back. Then she goes across the hall to ask Judy. But as you can imagine, Judy's pretty pissed about her blabbing to her friend about the baby. I told you that in confidence. And Elaine insists she didn't tell anybody. And she gets a door slammed in her face. And <laughs> we get Elaine's version of Newman saying, Jerry. My take on the scene, it's pretty transitional here. We just need to see Elaine realize that Jean-Paul is missing. Uh, I love bringing Judy in as well. And then the Jerry at the end is a great touch. Next, we're at Jerry's apartment. Jerry and Jean-Paul are back. <laughs> and Jerry says, you know what? I feel much better being home. It's a controlled environment. But Jean-Paul is so pissed. You know, he needs to sleep. It's 26 miles. It's a marathon. I can't believe he left a comfy hotel for this, he says, literally sleeping on Jerry's couch. Jerry says that wake-up guy was trouble. Jerry goes across the hall to tell Kramer to set his mental alarm and that heat pump is super, super noisy. All right, next we're on the street. Elaine is searching for Jean-Paul and we hear her voice over how exhausted she is. The street feels so unfamiliar. In the distance, a child is crying, fatherless, a bastard child perhaps. Ugh, her back aches, her heart aches, but my feet, my feet are resilient. Thank God I took off my heels and put on my Himalayan walking shoes. Yay! Elaine is so happy. Triumphant moment. My take on this scene, I think it's such a great scene. I love the cinematic feel to it. And I just really appreciate that we get resolution to this. They could have easily left this whole writer's block plot go unresolved. Um, you know, there's so many other plots to think about, but it's so satisfying to see Elaine figure this out. And I'm so happy for her at the end when she's like, yes. <laughs> also, I mean, I can kind of relate to it as a writer. I've had these moments, too, where you're just like nothing's clicking. The words aren't coming out properly. And you're, you're just like kind of so mad at your brain. And then a lot of times it's like it's stepping away from the process just to let you like just to let your mind breathe, let your brain breathe, like take a walk, do a chore, like cooking or laundry, as weird as it sounds, 
And then something will just pop into your head, at least in my experience. All of a sudden, I'm taking a walk or I'm folding my clothes and I'm like, oh my, oh my God, I, I totally know how I want to phrase this or I, I've got the perfect idea for this premise or whatever it is. That That is always worked for me, I, I will say, but it doesn't matter how many times I get writer's block, I, I think it'll never end. I'm like, oh my God, this will never end. And then I'm like, okay, let me just take a break and let me go have a cup of tea or read a book or something. And then it's like, oh wait, oh my God, I got it. So um, just seeing this scene <laughs> really, really feels satisfying. And I'm just as happy for Elaine as she is at the end of that scene. All right, next we're in Jerry's building. We see everyone sleeping peacefully and that heat pump just pump it away. And then we see the plug that it's plugged into. It sparks and everything goes dark. And then it's morning. Jerry wakes up and looks at his clock. 4.02? And he looks at his watch. Oh shit, it's 8.47. He gets him in a panic and wakes up Jean-Paul. The electricity went out. It's 8.47. Of course, Jean-Paul's like, 8.47? Idiot, I trusted you. Kramer enters, tells him how the heat pump blew all the fuses. Jerry's like, what happened to your mental alarm? Well, I must have hit the snooze. All right, next we're at the marathon. Jerry arrives with Jean Paul, is kind of pushing him through the crowd. A guy stops him but says, oh, no, you can go. And Jean Paul has to thank him. Fantastic route, man. He's so impressed with Jerry's driving. And Jerry's like, go, it's a race. Come on. Um, Really quick note, I thought this was fun. The guy who stops Jean Paul at first, he plays Neil in a future episode, the George counterpart who has the beautiful girlfriend. He's also Jason Alexander's stand-in. All right, next we're at Yankee Stadium. George tries to explain to Steinbrenner about his attitude because he thinks he's lost it. And Steinbrenner recommends a hot tub to let go of his stress. Back at the marathon, Jerry is trying to tell Elaine he never told anyone about that baby. Never even went in her building. Then how did she find out? Elaine asks. And he's like, did anyone check with the rabbi? (laughs) Super gossipy rabbi. Kramer offers Elaine some of his hot tea. He's carrying it in a thermos and he has a little cup of it. And then all of a sudden the runners appear. They can see them. And Jean-Paul is out front. Oh, they start cheering for him. Then we see Jean-Paul's point of view. We can hear his heart. We can hear his breathing. We see all the cups being offered. They're all water cups. But he grabs Kramer's hot teacup and (laughs) presumably pours it on his face. And we hear him scream in pain. There's a tag to this episode. George and Steinbrenner are in the hot tub. And I'm not really going to anything else about that. I don't like the Steinbrenner scenes. Um, My take on this scene, I love that Elaine doesn't believe Jerry. She's convinced he spilled the beans. And I have to point out the irony here. Kramer was the cause of a hot tea scalding, and he is just coming off a lawsuit where he got scalded by hot coffee. I just thought that was something to point out. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, and I will see you on the other side. Elegance, grace, Jean Paul, Jean Paul, drama, thrilling, Jean Paul, Jean Paul, classic, unusual, Jean Paul, Jean Paul, Johnny Depp, eyeliner, Jean Paul, Jean Paul, the new fragrance by Calvin Klein, Jean Paul, Jean Paul, and we're back. Uh, There were a couple of deleted scenes, and they both involve Elaine, so I want to talk about them. The first deleted scene was Jean-Paul and Elaine coming to George's office in Yankee Stadium. Apparently, Jean-Paul is there to take a tour of the stadium. And I realized when I was watching this deleted scene, because Elaine has a line, she's like, wow, really nice office, Georgie. I was like, I don't think we've ever seen or will ever see Elaine in George's office, which is pretty interesting. Anyway. So the stress doll that George refers to in the beginning of the episode, Jean-Paul spots it and thinks it's a voodoo doll and he freaks out and he takes a pair of scissors and he and he cuts it open and all the sand falls out and then he realizes it's not a voodoo doll and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, can you guys wait for me out front? Um, it's not a great scene. It's I'm, I'm actually really glad that they... <laughs> Even even though it was thrilling to see Elaine in George's office because we don't see that, um, it was a pretty stupid scene. And then the other deleted scene, it takes place when Elaine is leaving her place to go search for Jean-Paul. And she's on her stoop and there's the rabbi. 
And he thinks Jean Paul, he's like, I met your friend, Jean Paul, and basically assumes that it's her boyfriend because he's like, I'm so happy you found someone. She's like, no, 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 Rabbi, it's not like that. But of course, he's not listening. He says, interracial relationships pose many challenges, but I think they're worth it if you really love each other. And everyone I've spoken to in the building is very supportive. This is, again, just to reiterate what a blabbermouth this rabbi is. And then he ends it with, now everyone's opinion about the bastard child across from you, it's pretty mixed. So Jerry's right. The rabbi is to blame for the whole bastard child thing coming out. All right, now it's time to open Greg's sack lunch. Greg is our most dedicated contributor, and every week he sends us his sack lunch full of thoughts. First, I find his overall thoughts. He says, this episode has a lot going on, and while most of them are very simple premises, the funniest one to me is Jerry trying to help Jean-Paul wake up on time. It's not one of my favorite episodes for this reason. Elaine is kind of just an agitated shrew for most of it, and I don't like when she's painted as such. Okay, interesting. An agitated shrew. I definitely see what you're saying. Um, She's constantly defending her alarm clock and her ability to set it. I don't know. I don't see it that way. I mean, I think you can tell from this episode so far, I really do enjoy this episode. Um, But yeah, I agree. I think the Jean-Paul and Jerry dynamic is the best part of this episode. (laughs) The whole That whole premise is really funny. And I just like that Jerry is so invested in it. Next, I find in Greg Sack, his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, I love the face Elaine makes when she says the woman from her building had a baby and the guy just took off. That grimace is just so funny to me. Oh, I love that too. I love the little like gossipy voice. and Oh my God. (laughs) I think Elaine would be very fun to gossip with. Greg goes on to say, my favorite Elaine moment is when she accidentally sets the microwave timer wrong and she instinctively gets defensive and says, don't say anything. Love that too. Love that too. Like I said, I just think what a brilliant way to kind of fuel all of this skepticism for Jerry (laughs) and Jean-Paul. It's just so, it's such a wonderful way to do that and really believable too. I mean, she likes her muffin hot. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that either. Next, Greg says, Elaine's best scene is probably when she's wandering the streets looking for Jean-Paul and gets the motivation that cures her writer's block. It's hokey, but at least it gives her something. Exactly. And which is why I mentioned, you know, that was that's a plot they could have just kind of left unresolved. But I'm so glad that they dedicated an entire scene, a scene that, like I said, it's kind of cinematic. We've got the voiceover, you know, a little little dramatic for a JLD to play with. And I think it's great. I think it's so great. I'm glad we get that for her. Next in Greg's sack is his scene swap idea. He says, again, Elaine just needed more to do in this episode than she was given. As usual, if there was a way to work her into George's story in some way, or even dealing with Kramer and his hot tub, it wouldn't have seemed like she got so little. Interesting. Um... I kind of disagree, but I'll get into that with my final notes. I think I actually think she gets a good chunk, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Finally, in Greg's sack are his extra thoughts. He says, George's scene where he's yelling at the guys on the phone, swearing at them like they do, and Mr. Wilhelm hearing him is one of my favorite moments of George's tenure with the Yankees. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an interesting plot. You know, Jason Alexander sort of has his own one-off thing off to the side, and I really enjoy it. It's kind of nice to see like George, he doesn't have a lot of bravado. He's really just kind of being as normal as possible for George. You know, there's no kind of attitude or nothing's pissing him off about these guys. Like he genuinely likes them and he had a good time with them. So (laughs) I kind of like seeing that rapport between him and those guys. Lastly, Greg says, the actor who plays Jean-Paul cracks me up. I almost wish he had made more appearances because he's just another victim of this bumbling foursome of idiots. (laughs) Yeah, I guess it wouldn't have made sense for Jean-Paul to come back considering everything he's gone through with them. Um, But I totally agree. Jeremiah Burkett, brilliant, brilliant performance. One of my favorite guest stars of the entire series. You know, he could have come back for the finale when you think about it, when everyone comes back to testify against them in court. I could could have seen him come back and complain about, uh, you know, how they pretty much ruined his career. (laughs) Thank you so much, Greg, for sending in your thoughts this week. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, my favorite Elaine moments. 
I love when she collapses against the fridge when Jean-Paul says, you miss set the timer. <laughs> you just feel that unfortunate coincidence in that moment, like how she's like, oh my God, no. <laughs> I really like that part. And a close second would be her frustrated scene when she's trying to write. I love the way she just picks up that shoe and squeezes it and grits her teeth. Very funny. And then my final notes for the episode. It's a fave for me, I have to admit. I mean, I think it mostly has to do with Jean-Paul Jean-Paul and Jeremiah Burkett's portrayal. But I think JLD really gets some juicy comedy here, for sure. The bickering with her and Jerry is great. It's a bit rare, like I said, but I really enjoy it when they're at odds. And also, I really think that JLD gets such a wide range of comedy. We get a little gossipy energy in the beginning, telling Jerry about Judy. And then we see her get stressed. We see her blowing up at Jerry, uh, her worried about Jean-Paul, and then so relieved when she figures out her catalog writing. Um, It's just quite the buffet of delights from JLD. And if I love anything, it's a buffet. Trust me. And I think that's all I can say about the hot tub. Please be sure to follow Hot and Heavy on social media. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me some thoughts, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.